Um, I want to ask everybody if you have your Bibles with you or maybe you have a, a Bible app on your phone. Go ahead and be turning or um, what would you call that? Touch screening, dialing <laughs> to uh, the book of Amos. The book of Amos chapter 5. All right, Amos 5, beginning in verse 6. Let's bow our heads. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I want to just pray at this time that uh, you would bless the uh, exposition of your word and bless our understanding. And Father, help us to know what it is we must do as the people of God to serve you and honor you, not only here in the church, but out there in the world. Because we all know the world is becoming a difficult place. It's changing quickly. Uh, I think, Father, a lot of times we don't realize just how much influence we can have upon the world. So I want to pray, Father, that you help us to, to see our influence today. See just how powerful we are in Jesus Christ. And convict us to, to make some changes. And, Father, you can use us to do just that. Father, I also want to pray that you be with anyone today that doesn't know about Jesus Christ. They don't know who he is. They don't understand him. Help them to realize who he is today, to know that he can save them from their sins. And may this be the day of salvation. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's a, a lot of really interesting messages in the book of Amos that could apply to uh, American society today. And we're going to look at one of those uh, passages here in chapter 5. Uh, we're not specifically going to be looking at verse 24 of Amos 5 today, but I am going to start out with it. I want to read it for you. Uh, in Amos 5, 24, here's what the word says. Let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Now, here in the United States of America, justice is something I believe that we all value and cherish. Uh, we have a justice system, for example. But I want you to know the devil is trying to take that away from us. The devil has a way of hijacking, if you will, hijacking religious and political systems. The devil perverts what is good and he distorts it into something that resembles the good, but in reality, it's a far cry from it. And I can do a whole message on the devil being a pervert because that's what he's good at. He perverts the good things of God. I like calling him that because I don't like the devil. Now, the prophet Isaiah, not Amos, but the prophet Isaiah lived in a time where justice was being twisted. And in Isaiah 5.20, he declared, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Now, since Amos was actually prophesying during the same time as Isaiah, and since he cried out for justice to rain down, we're going to take a look at what was happening during Amos's day and time. And we're going to see what the Lord has to say about how to truly allow justice to run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. How does that happen? Well, the Lord gives us some guidelines here. And we're going to go ahead and get started with this passage in Amos 5, beginning with verses 6 through 7. Here we go, beginning in verse 6. Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph and devour it, with no one to quench it in Bethel. You who turn justice to wormwood and lay righteousness to rest in the earth. Very simple passage, but there's a lot in there. And we're going to dig into it. I think it best to begin with verse 7 as we catch a glimpse of the problem that the Lord was addressing to Amos, or through Amos, if you would. The nation of Israel had forsaken God to the point that justice and righteousness no longer prevailed in the land, but rather it had become wormwood. Justice and righteousness had become wormwood. What in the world does that mean? Well, wormwood in the Hebrew is la'ana, and it's a plant. A plant known today as Artemisia absinthium. And this bitter tasting herb has long been considered a hallucinogen and a poison, most particularly a poison. A reference to his poison is found in Revelation chapter 8, verse 11, 
One of the prophecies in the end times, it says a third of the waters became wormwood. Many men died from the water because it was made bitter. Bitter, poison. Conservants, consuming wormwood in excess is actually toxic. It's been linked to seizures and even death. So Israel was dealing with a justice system that was toxic. That's what God was relaying through Amos. Israel's justice system had become toxic and poisonous. The people had put righteousness to death. They had killed it. They had poisoned it. And righteousness had died. The Lord declared that if the people failed to seek him, that he would break out like fire in the house of Joseph. Now the Lord, when he talked about breaking out like fire, he was speaking of judgment. And we know that God was bringing the Assyrians upon his people as judgment, judgment on the nation. So he was talking about judgment. This reminds us of God's repeated warnings back in Amos chapters 1 and 2. When he said numerous times, I will send a fire. If you do not shape up, he's saying, I will send a fire among you. These warnings, you can see them back in Amos chapters 1 and 2, as I've already said, but specifically chapter 1, verses 4, 7, 10, 12, and 14, and also in chapter 2, verses 2 and 5. So he said, God said, I will send a fire. But the people were not heeding his warning. So why would he send a fire among the house of Joseph? What did this mean? Well, Joseph, as, as we know, was a son of Jacob. And Jacob is regarded as the patriarch of the Israelites as his name was later changed to Israel. It was through his son, Joseph, that the people of Israel were actually saved from extinction by a famine as they were brought into Egypt, a place of abundance. So the blessing continued, the blessing upon God's people continued because of Joseph, because he rescued God's people, and because of this, Israel, the people who were headed for annihilation, they were able to be founded again, if you will. So God was saying that he would remove his blessing all the way back to the founding of his people. He would devour Israel as with fire. He would shake the nation to its foundation. And let me tell you, this should be a warning to any nation and a warning to any church, for that matter, that should we forsake the principles upon which we were founded, we're heading for judgment. If you agree with that, say amen. I mean, it's, it's a principle we see in God's word, so hopefully you will say amen. Think about our nation. It was founded on godly principles. And there are some people out there that want to deny this, but it was Founded on godly principles. And since that time, the church, yes, I'm blaming it on the church, the church has gone, grown lax in its proclamation of truth and justice. A lot of the responsibility, a lot of the problems rest squarely on the shoulders of the church. We've not been out there sharing the gospel like we should. And so our nation... And its lawmakers have pretty much followed the church's lead. I believe that we have been failing at our responsibility of sharing the gospel and being truthful and righteous people, the people that God has called us to be. You see, until we, the people of God, get serious about judgment and righteousness, we can never expect to see the nation do the same. Notice that God's fire could not even be quenched in Bethel. Now, the Hebrew name Bethel means house of God. House of God. In Amos' day, Bethel was the site of the king's chapel where Amaziah the priest served. It was the place where people would make their pilgrimage to hear the law and worship the Lord. Like, you know, like us going to church. Equate that to us going to worship each and every Sunday. But based on what Amos tells us, if you continue through his book... He tells us that their worship was all show. It was not at all from the heart. It was just show. Commentator Warren Wearsby says, Bethel, the house of God, would become beth Haven, the house of nothing. You know, I've seen neighborhoods named beth Haven. I wouldn't move there. <laughs> it means house of nothing. 
But Wearsby continues to ask, if Gentiles who never had the written law of God suffered fiery punishment for their sins, how much more would the Jews be punished who actually possessed God's holy law? Now, apply that to believers. Apply that to Christians today. Peter said in 1 Peter 4, 17, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. I'm sure that's an Old Testament allusion. Judgment will begin at the house of God. It's going to begin at Bethel. Judgment will, will begin with those who actually call themselves God's people. For all of us who are looking around at the atrocities that are happening in our nation, and we're saying, God, when are you going to do something about it? Be careful what you wish for. Because he might do something about it starting with the church. If you back up to verse 3, we read how the cities, which number many, shall only have a few remaining within them of the house of Israel. And that's talking about a remnant. There's going to be a remnant of faithful followers and faithful worshipers of God. Wearsby tells us that the phrase, seek the Lord, that we see in verse 6, it applied to Israel in ancient days, but it applies to Christians today. We need to be seeking the Lord. Now, even if the whole nation doesn't respond to the message and return to the Lord, here's what we need to understand. A remnant can return. A small group, that's a remnant, a small group can return and receive the Lord's help and blessing. And Wearsby reminds us of how God was willing to save the evil city of Sodom if he found ten, just ten righteous people in it. Hey, the church in America. Maybe we have been like Israel. Maybe we have neglected our duties. Maybe we have been failing to share the gospel because we're afraid to speak out, to speak up. And maybe that's what's going on. Maybe the nation has followed. Maybe that's why we're living in what seems to be an ungodly nation. Perhaps both the nation and the church will come under fiery judgment by God that's yet to be seen. But let me encourage you. Let me encourage you that a faithful group of believers, a remnant of God's people, can stay the Lord's hand, can hold back his hand of judgment, especially a praying group of believers. I talked about prayer just a few weeks ago. It's vital. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 9, some of you may know this and some of you may not, but in Deuteronomy chapter 9, God got so mad um, you know, at Mount Sinai, when the people were worshiping the golden calf and, and such, he got so mad, he threatened to completely wipe out his people. Did you know that? He wanted to destroy every last one of them, except for Moses, and then he wanted to start over from scratch with Moses. But you know what Moses did? He prayed. He sought the Lord in prayer. And Moses, through his prayers, persuaded the Lord to spare his people. Prayer is powerful. Look at verses 10 through 13. We're going to skip down a bit. 10 through 13. They hate the one who rebukes in the gate, and they abhor the one who speaks uprightly. Therefore, because you tread down the poor and take grain taxes from him, though you have built houses of hewn stone, yet you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink wine from them. For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins, afflicting the just and taking bribes, diverting the poor from justice at the gate. Therefore the prudent keeps silent at that time, for it is an evil time. Now verse 10 speaks about how they hate the one who rebukes in the gate. Gates weren't just an entry or doorway into a city. They were where prophets cried out. They were where kings judged. They were where people met. The city gate was typically a massive and often complex structure consisting of an outer gate and an inner one providing a second line of defense with a space in between. It was the space between those two gates, sometimes just a corridor with recessed guard rooms, sometimes a more spacious courtyard, it was in that space that agreements were verbally sealed in the presence of witnesses and cases were heard and tried. Amos speaks about the one who judges in the gate, who speaks truth. How that individual was abhorred 
and hated. Let me remind you that anyone wanting to live a life of sin and corruption will despise truth, hate morality, and abhor law and authority. In verse 12, we read how the just are afflicted as some of the judiciaries receive bribes and how the poor are diverted from justice. Wearsby says this, and, and I like to, I'm just putting the blame on Wearsby. When I call out his name, I'm telling you, he's saying some things that are really hard that you, you need to know is not coming from me. And he wrote these words back in like the 1970s, and it's amazing how they apply to today. But here's what Wearsby says. He says, when the dishonest leaders attempted to force their lies on the people and manipulate the court, if somebody rebuked them, they turned on that person and tried to silence him or her. Kind of like our cancel culture today. This is Wearsby, like 1970s, he said this. See, there was sometimes corruption within the courtyard of the gate. Listen as I share an example a biblical example concerning David's son Absalom about how he lied and turned people away from receiving justice at the gate. Here's what 2 Samuel 15, 2 through 6 says. Now Absalom would rise early and stand beside the way to the gate. So it was, whenever anyone who had a lawsuit came to the king for a decision, then Absalom would say to him, Look, your case is good and right. But there is no deputy of the king to hear you. Moreover, Absalom would say, Oh, that I were made judge in the land, and everyone who has any suit or cause would come to me, then I would give him justice. And so it was, whenever anyone came near to bow down to him, that he would put out his hand and take him and kiss him. In this manner, Absalom acted toward all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Like any great politician, Absalom... Through flattering words and handshakes and kisses, he deceived people into following him instead of turning to the true source of authority and justice. Now, Wearsby says God established human government because of the sinfulness of the human heart. Without the authority of government and society, everything would fall apart and the strong would enslave the weak and the rich would exploit the poor. He says righteousness and justice should be the pillars that uphold society, but these selfish rulers had thrown the pillars to the ground. He continues to say, one of the evidences that the pillars of national justice are shaking and ready to fall is the increase of lawsuits. That's back in the 70s. Oh, there's a whole lot more evidences today, right? That the pillars are going to be thrown to, or are being thrown to the ground. Anyway, Wiersbe cites Hosea 10, 3 through 4 in the New International Version, which says this. They will say, we have no king because we did not revere the Lord. That's why they, they have that attitude. We don't want a king. Why? Because they're not revering the Lord. We have no king. Because we did not revere the Lord, they make many promises, take false oaths, and make agreements. Therefore, lawsuits spring up like poisonous weeds in the plowed field. There's that word poisonous, wormwood, toxic justice system. You know, and some of the things I mentioned or read here remind us of things we're seeing today. Amos went on to picture the rich trampling the poor into the mud by claiming their crops for payment. Uh, of the high rents that they were charging. The rich were literally taking the food right out of the mouths of their tenants and their children. And if these hungry tenants appealed to the local judges for justice, the wealthy landowners bought off the judges. So what did the rich do with this ill-gotten gain? They used it to build mansions for themselves and to plant luxurious vineyards. They anticipated lounging in their big houses and drinking wine. But the Lord had other plans. He announced that they would neither live in their mansions nor drink their wine because the Assyrians were coming to destroy all their houses and vineyards. So what did most of the people do about all these injustices taking place around them? What did most of the people do? We see it in verse 11. The prudent keep silent at that time, for it is an evil time. They keep silent. Now, a lot of times we hear that word prudent, and we think, oh, they're wise. Prudent, wise. That, that is one definition of the word prudent. It means wise, but here's some other definitions. Cautious, careful, weary, or not weary, but wary, but yeah, we, we grow weary during these times, but cautious, careful, and wary. The people of Amos' time did what a lot of us are doing today because we're scared. 
When we see evil being called good and good being called evil, and when we witness terrible injustices, we too remain cautiously silent, don't we? Why? Because it's an evil time, and we know that speaking truth can lead to being targeted for violence. It can lead to some kind of personal loss, so we're really careful. Look at verses 14 through 15, and we'll finish this passage up. 14 through 15. It says, here, Seek good and not evil that you may live. So the Lord God of hosts will be with you as you have spoken. Hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gates. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. So I want to back up and share a little more context of Israel's status. Amos was prophesying during a, a period of national optimism. Everything was going good around them. Business was booming. Boundaries were bulging. But below the surface, greed and injustice were festering. The people were boasting that the Lord is with us. I mean, after all, wasn't the nation enjoying great prosperity? Certainly that was a sign of God's blessing, right? And weren't the people active in religious activities, bringing their sacrifices and their offerings to the shrines and didn't the king have a special priest in a royal sanctuary in Bethel where he consulted with Amaziah about the affairs of the kingdom? Yeah, all these things were true. But they could not be used as evidence of the blessing of God. They were but a thin veneer of religious self-righteousness over the rotting corpse of the nation. The only proof that God is with us is that we truly love him as Christians, that we truly First of all, believe in who Jesus Christ is, that we're strong in our faith, that we believe the word of God and everything written in it, but that we're obedient to God, that we, we love him, that we do his will. You see, religion without righteousness and justice in the land is just hypocrisy. No matter how many people attend religious meetings or go to church, if the result is not obedience to God and concern for our neighbor, the meetings are a failure. And no matter how many politicians claim that their faith is important to them, if what they say does not line up with the teachings of the Bible, their faith is either a sham or pathetically weak. How can we claim to love the good if we don't hate evil? Oh, hate's a strong word, pastor. We're not supposed to hate as Christians. Hog wash. The Bible tells us things we can hate. Here's one of them. We're to hate evil. We are to hate evil. But we ignore what's wrong so many times. We ignore what's wrong. We bury our head in the sand. You know, as Christians, we study the Bible. We study it, but we probably view our devotional time as a safe place where we don't have to think about the world and its problems. But in Psalm chapter 119, 104, it says, through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. So if we're listening to God when we read his word, and, he, and let me tell you, he, he's going to remind us of what's going on. We can't bury our head in the sand and think, oh, that's our safe haven when we read his word. I mean, it is a safe haven, but it's not like we're not going to have any thoughts or convictions about our world around us because God's going to talk to us. He's going to remind us of what's going on. He's going to speak to us about truth and justice, and he's going to show us how we can make a difference. But so many times we hear him and just go, you know, go our own way. Act like God never said a word. Seeking the good means rejecting the evil and not being ashamed to take a stand against what's wrong. We must strive for justice in the gate. That's what the word says. We must strive for justice in the gate, meaning we've got to speak truth at all times, even when it's unpopular. And we must elect politicians who aren't afraid to speak the truth. And not just that, we need to elect judiciaries who have faith in Jesus Christ. And here's, here's something we all need to hear. We need to call pastors who have a spine, who are not afraid of losing church members or their precious job. We need to do these 
things, if we ever hope to have a chance at averting corruption and experiencing true justice, if we ever hope to, to hope to avert national ruin and God's judgment, and if we ever hope to see revival. So let me ask you, final question, is there any hope for such a, a wicked society as we see in the book of Amos, and is there any hope for our society? Well, there's always hope, isn't there? We serve a mighty God, a God of new beginnings. There's always hope. You see, as long as the grace of God is at work, verse 15, as long as the grace of God is at work, it may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Who knows what God would do if only a faithful remnant turned to him and sought his mercy. A faithful remnant turned to him and prayed for revival. That he may be gracious to us. In Ezekiel 22 verse 30 we read this. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall. And stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land. That I should not destroy it. But I found no one. Let me tell you, God is still looking for wall builders, for intercessors who will plead with God to send revival and renewal to his church. For it's only when God's spirit is allowed to work among his people that the flood of evil can be stopped and righteousness and justice flourish in the land. You see, the saints want God to judge the wicked, but the time has come that judgment must begin where? With the house of God. With the house of God. If only a remnant will repent and turn to God, then there is hope that he will send the revival that we desperately need. So, oh Lord, we pray. Let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Now, in Romans chapter 3, and I want to encourage you to pay attention if you don't know anything about Jesus Christ and who he is and how he came to save you. I want you to pay attention right now. In Romans chapter 3, the Apostle Paul laid out the utter depravity of mankind. Here's what he said, Romans 3, this is 10 through 23. He said, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. For all, skipping down to verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We've all come up short. Simply put, based on this passage I just shared, when we do our own thing, live our own way, apart from truth, apart from justice, and apart from God, it's called sin. We've sinned, and sin separates us from God. We just read, for all have sinned and what? Fall short. They fall short of the glory of God. They're separated from God's glory. They're separated from eternal life. That's not the end of the story, praise God. We don't have to remain separated. In 1 Peter 4, verses 2 to 3, we're told that we should not live in the flesh for the lust of men, walking in such things as lewdness, Lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. We're not supposed to be doing these things. And then in verse 5, we read of those who live in this manner that, quote, they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. We're all going to stand before God one day. We're all mess-ups. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. We are going to stand before God. The only wise and one true and just judge that there is. 
We're all going to stand before that righteous judge. We're going to answer for our crimes, but let's just boil it down to sin. We're all going to answer for our sins. How will we answer? What's the punishment? Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. I said on Wednesday night, in the book of Revelation, we read about the first death and the second death. The first death is when our body ceases to function. The second death is when we're separated from God for all eternity. Once our body stops functioning, we either go to eternal life or eternal death. Those are your options. Eternal death, that's the second death. And that's the punishment for sin. The wages of sin is death. So the penalty for doing only what we want to do, living in lawlessness, such as we see all around us today, the penalty for that is ultimately death. When we pass away, the penalty for that is death if, if we're not saved from that. But Romans 6.23 doesn't stop there. It says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we don't have to die for our sins. We can have eternal life. How? Through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ our Lord. So if the Bible's very specific, I could share some other verses, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and close. But the Bible's very specific that if we will repent of our sins and confess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, we can be forgiven of our sins and receive eternal life. What is repent? That means to do a 180. Like, here's our sin. We're going to turn and go the opposite direction. Turn our back to our sin and turn toward God. Repentance is doing a 180 and then never going back to that sin again. It's feeling sor sorrow for our sin and turning to God. Never going back to that sin. That's repentance. So we've got to repent of our sins, be sorry for our sins, not go back to it, and then confess that there's only one person who can save us from the penalty of our sins, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus died for our punishment when he died on the cross. The cross was Jesus dying for our punishment. But he didn't just die and remain in the ground. That would have accomplished nothing. He rose again from the grave, showing that he had victory over death, And he had victory over the thing that sends us to death. He had victory over sin as well. The Bible is also very clear that just as Jesus was raised from the glory by God the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life, or meaning we too are going to be raised just as Christ was raised in newness of life if we confess him as Savior and Lord. So if the Lord is speaking to you today about repentance, being sorry for your sin, and coming to know Jesus as Savior and Lord, I want to encourage you to come during our time of song. I'll be happy to share more. Let's bow our heads. Father, I want to pray for continued conviction. I know the Holy Spirit is already working, but I pray for continue, continued conviction. I also pray for boldness. So many times, one who doesn't know Christ is afraid to get up and walk the aisle, afraid of what other people will think. But help them to put those fears aside and realize that we were all in that place at one point. No one's going to judge them. Help them to be bold and come forward to know more about Jesus and confess him as Savior and Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.